It didn't work last time, but it seems to be working this time. Hello, everybody. Sorry if I missed you yesterday, or uh, I don't know what what happened. We had a little uh, Facebook trouble, something which we've been managed to avoid for a long time. So uh, if you're checking us out there and you missed us yesterday, it's probably will make its way to uh, YouTube. I feel, and if you haven't checked us out on YouTube, you can go look at the Jewish Experience YouTube channel where they're not only live at five episodes, but there are lots of other great things that you could enjoy from lots of other of our, of our wonderful team of educators. Um, welcome to the show. I uh, hope you're enjoying this nice photo I took this uh, yesterday morning at dawn. You know, there's a little dew. I can see, you can see the dew on the grass over here a little bit. Uh, I walked out of my house at about dawn on my way to my uh, daily Talmud class. It was about 5.30 in the morning. And, uh, and I was met with this gorgeous dawn uh, sky. Couldn't help but shoot a, a quick picture. And uh, I just uh, photoshopped it just a little bit, a little, little bit. You know, the, uh, the, 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 I think that it's fair and reasonable if, uh, if you, cause you, what happens is you look at this like scene or, and, and you see it and it's so vivid and so beautiful. And then you take a picture and the picture is like, okay. Eh. And then you, you know, you, you embellish it and you, and you bring out the, the color and the, you know, and the, and the intensity of the light and the, uh, you know, and it becomes more dynamic by Photoshop or some other photo editing thing. I happen to like this little uh, um, app, which is free, which is called Snapseed. If you want a, a very pretty intuitive, easy, free photo editing uh, app in your phone, try Snapseed. Someone uh, said it, sent it to me and, um, and it can embellish the photos, but it's not because this isn't what's really there. It's because the photo without, you know, no uh, camera lens yet, I think is as good as the eye. And so you see it one way and it's beautiful. And it's amazing. And the photos sometimes capture some of that and sometimes not. And so you need a little bit of of, uh, it needs a little bit of embellishing. A lot of, uh, uh, recently I've seen a lot of, of stuff on, um, on the concept of deep fake uh, videography, which is, uh, which is similar, but a little scarier, where apparently, you know, there are more and more facile technology to take a, a videotape of someone and to change it and edit it seamlessly, which you invisibly would never be able to believe that you could put words in someone's mouth and you could use, uh, you know, AI, uh, cold, uh, video footage and be able to make it look like someone said something that they didn't say. So there was a very famous, uh, one that was going around where they made Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the, uh, the head of Facebook look like he was saying that he was collecting data to take over the world or something silly like that. And it's, and it's right there. It's a video. It's these words are like coming out of his mouth and it was going around on his own platform. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's interesting to me about this, these possibilities is it creates very interesting questions as are flowing around the, flying around the world today about um, editorial uh, obligations or potentially uh, problems of a, of a platform, a social media platform, particularly like Facebook or other social media platforms. What are they allowed to, to, uh, to uh, curate? In what ways? What kind of things can they, uh, you know, can they forbid on their platform? And these are interesting questions. Of course, they emerged uh, in in uh, in to the news around January when the then president of the United States lost his uh, privileges to to tweet and post on Facebook, uh, and that was quite, uh, you know, maybe better, maybe not, but very interesting. Certainly, uh, how we feel about it. it was a very interesting decision. Um, I had a, a there was a Supreme Court case recently where I, I saw that um, you may have seen this in the news. It was a girl who was on a, a cheerleading squad in high school somewhere. And uh, I forget exactly what, uh, what, what happened over there. She didn't make the, the cut or the first string or something. She got uh, benched for a game. I don't know what it was, but she a afterwards, she posted some obscenities about the coach and the school and the program. And, uh, and, uh, and when they found it, uh, they suspended her for the duration of the year from the cheerleading squad. So her parents 
uh, took the, uh, uh, the matter up in court and it ended up in the Supreme Court of the United States of America, whether or not it was uh, in violation of her free, her First Amendment for rights of free speech, uh, that she should be able to say obscenities about her coach and her school uh, and not uh, have any um, you know, ramifications or consequences for that speech. Uh, a, because like we said, maybe it's protected by the First Amendment and B, because um, it was said outside of the context of school and how could the school impose a consequence on something that she said out, outside of, of school grounds or borders or I don't know what. And the state and the court went, went to the Supreme Court. Fascinating case, unbelievable. I think it's extremely interesting. And uh, you know what would we say? So um, I, I, you know, having uh, given a little bit of thought anyway, I believe that uh, if this came to, uh, to not to this the United States Supreme Supreme Court, but it, well, let's say we went to the Supreme Jewish Court of the Land, the Sanhedrin. What would the Sanhedrin say about this young lady and her, uh, you know? And her uh, her protected or not so protected uh, digital media post, social media post, would she would she be uh, would it, would the school be uh, in the right to suspend her for what she uh, had said and posted or not? So I um, I would venture to guess that um, that the um, that the Sanhedrin would rule against the girl and her family and uphold the rights of the team to suspend her for her behavior, even though it was outside of school. She posted some uh, very unpleasant uh, things about her, her, her own coach and her own team and school. And, um, and no matter where or when that was said, it was said extremely loudly. It was a, um, you know, a post that went, went, I mean, because of the court case and the situation and the news about around it, it's gone very viral now and it's been, uh, it's be become public knowledge to millions of Americans. But uh, even before that, it was certainly went around the community and it got back to our school. And, uh, you know, I think Jewishly, we would, we would uh, very clearly recognize that we all have responsibilities uh, to be careful about what we say about others and the way that we communicate publicly, certainly, all the more so. And there are no school boundaries uh, that uh, outside of which one would not be rest you know, restricted or would not be uh, um, obligated to, to express restraint about what they say. There's no, uh, there should be no distinction made, you know, the fact that it was, wasn't said during the school day on school grounds, it was posted on social media later that evening, makes no difference. Um, you know, she, she uh, would certainly bear the consequences of a, of a, of a cheerleading squad who would be uninterested to have such a person, uh, you know, around on their team that, that year and, and felt uh, that she needed to, you know, learn a lesson. Uh, we, I think we would uphold the rights of the school to have imposed that, that uh, consequence. And, and we would not in any way, shape or form defend uh, her rights, although she certainly is allowed to. She, she's not gonna bear any criminal consequences. Uh, even though it was very distasteful and very offensive, but uh, but the school, you know, the team is allowed to say to her, "Listen, you're, this is not behavior, uh, public behavior befitting our team, and so we'll, we're going to suspend you from our team. We're, we're you know, you're not can't you don't represent us well with such a with such a with such speech, and uh, and so I, I think that uh, yeah, this is uh, just to me." Uh, sort of resonated because throughout the couple of years of clean speech campaigns that we've done, every once in a while, we'll get a comment from someone who wants to know if our campaign is a, you know, is a somehow, um, you know, uh, antithetical to an American attitude uh, towards uh, First Amendment rights, and um, and I think that it's a it's an opportunity here for us to clarify. Um, we we. Uh, the Jew, you know, uh, the Jewish guidelines for proper speech, acceptable speech, and prohibited speech uh, don't mean to say that America should um, necessarily have laws that uh, will, would 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 apply criminal punishment or punitive uh, consequences to to people who would uh, speak uh, in, a, in a mean way about others. But uh, within that, uh, within the, the entire breadth of speech that American law will allow, each and every one of us should express some restraint. We should recognize that we are, uh, we are responsible uh, for pain and suffering and loss and harm that our words cause. And therefore we ought to be careful about what we say, print, post, and publish 
uh, out in the world at all times. Um, and uh, we, you know, if there would be uh, consequences to bear in terms of the response of those about whom we speak, we will have to bear those consequences. We shouldn't be protected uh, for, to say something offensive from any consequence that, uh, you know, or, or uh, an harm to us that it, that it might cause. If, uh, you know, we should, we should be allowed to experience the, the, uh, the consequences. And maybe that will uh, inspire us to do a better job of policing our own speech. If it's not going to be uh, forbidden by, the, by, by American law, then it can at least be uh, um, something about which we would express restraint ourselves. We will, we will police ourselves and we will express a mindful restraint about saying things which we shouldn't. And um, so I think, uh, so it was a nice opportunity. That's a little bit of news. Uh, that's the news, folks. And um, and with here, we'll go back to uh, something more eternal. Although I, I think that that uh, is not, you know, today I was I was cleaning out, we were cleaning out the cupboards and I found my my clean speech bracelet here. I've got a couple left over from the pandemic that we didn't get to distribute. So if you'd like, if you'd like one or, or 20,000 of them, I've got them sitting here in a box. Uh, so just let me know. Um, <laughs> I kid you not. We actually thought we thought we would, uh, you know, we wouldn't see anybody in person during the pandemic, but we at least mailed them out. So we ordered like 25,000 of these from, uh, you know, on a slow boat from China. When they arrived, um, we we had already realized by the time they arrived that uh, the postage, the 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 increased cost in postage was going to make it extraordinarily uh, pro cost prohibitive to send them out. So we didn't send them out and they are sitting here. Uh, if you know, the other thing I'm looking for is if you know a nice artist who would potentially be uh, creative enough to take 20,000 of his little rubber uh, wristbands and make something artistic out of them, that would be kind of fun. So let me know, send, uh, send them my way. Uh, yesterday, just to uh, get back to the topic at hand, we were speaking about, about the Parsha and the connection between the Parsha of the week and the particular period of Jewish history that we are in which as we know is called the counting of the Omer, the Sphere of Omer. And the count that we make is a seven-fold count. We count seven weeks. So a week is seven days, so it's seven times seven. And that number figures very prominently in the Parsha. We read Parsha Bihar when it talks about the, the agricultural cycle in the land of Israel back in the day and, and, and somewhat practiced to this very day that every seven years, is a, is a seven-year cycle, and the seventh year is a Shemitah year, a sabbatical year, a year um, where we uh, seize and desist from all agricultural efforts in the land of Israel. And then when you have seven of those seven cycles, the Parsha says, right after that, the 50th year after those 49 is also special, and it's another year uh, of, of cessation. It's another rest year, another sabbatical year, but it has another name. It has, it's called in Hebrew, Yovel, which is actually the, um, the absolute source and etymology of the word Jubilee. It's a transliteration of the word Yovel, Jubilee. And uh, Jubilee, as we know, it means a kind of a festive celebration, you know, a Jubilee. So um, this uh, really um, springs from the understanding of what these restful agricultural sabbatical years are about. What was the point? So let's say that, that you're a farmer in uh, back in the day in, in the land of Israel somewhere, lived up maybe north where, you know, you've got a great farm growing wine grapes on the gorgeous, you know, hillsides up there in the sun, uh, not far from the Mediterranean. But then, you know, uh, that's that a very, very um, involved lifestyle. Being a farmer is, you know, you got to get up when, the, when it's dawn like this and you work till dusk like that. And it's a long day. It's a lot of work. Being a farmer is hard work. I wouldn't know, but I, but I hear. And, uh, and if you were a farmer and you had a long, a long day, a long week, long year, you know, after a couple of years, you would need a break. What kind of a break? You'd need a holy break. And the idea would be that if a person uh, was, was meant to take an entire year off from farming, that they should, they should spend that year in holy pursuits. Should take a year to study, to learn, to to uh, you know uh, sharpen this the, the spiritual whip, as it were, uh, and that's really a concept we have even till to to this day. Person takes a sabbatical, uh, you know, it's usually in academic circles. They're going to go do some research. They're going to they're going to go you know spend that time 
uh, you know, studying in some way and come back better prepared for, for next. So um, that's co concept here uh, as well. We're going to take one year out of seven and study a little bit and, and deepen our, our spiritual, uh, you know, our efforts and our, in our spiritual pursuits. It's not at all dissimilar from the week. We have a, a, a Sabbath every seven days, and it's a similar idea. We're going to take a day off of our work in order to um, spend that day more exclusively on our spiritual goals. We're going to spend a little more time, you know, uh, taking our time during the prayer services. And they are, there's more services to be said, and there's a Parsha to be read, and there are, you know, there are mitzvahs to be done. It's a, it's a spiritual day. That's what a sabbatical day is, a Sabbath. So they have a sabbatical year, and every seven cycles of seven years, they have one more year, which is a, a 50th year. Now that, if we bring it back to the uh, period of the calendar that we're now in, the counting of the Omer, that 50th day actually would correspond with the day just after the count of 49, which is for us the holiday of Shavuos. Okay, we actually celebrate it right after um, we've counted seven weeks of seven days. That, that, in fact, the name Shavuos means weeks. It's a holiday of weeks because we know that after we count seven weeks, we celebrate the holiday. And um, I believe even in in, um, in Christianity, Lahavdal, there is a there is a, a, a festival of sorts, a celebration based on uh, the concept of Shavuos and the holiday of Shavuos that they've made, and it's called Pentecost. And Pentecost comes from the word. Uh, the Greek, which would be 50, like the Pentagon has five sides and Pentecost would be the 50th day holiday. So again, it's a, it's a similar idea. It's the 50th. It's an equivalent to like a Jubilee year. And, it's a, and it would be the big uh, culmination of counting 49. Now that, that idea too of 49, um, uh, you know, we, we have spoken before about how there's a, um, there's sort of a journey here, a roadmap of the, of the seven spheros, the seven divine traits that we try to emulate in general. And, and we focus on them, each one during one of these weeks, each one during one of these days of, one of these weeks. So today um, we are actually in week six and, um, and maybe we'll just mention the, the trait of week six. So week six, the, uh, the sixth of the seven traits is yesod. Yesod, which is a Hebrew word, which means foundation. And really, uh, foundation in the sense like when you have a building, you know, if you want a strong building, you have to have a strong basis. And the foundation, of course, if it would be just a, a blank foundation with nothing on it, it would be pretty meaningless. You have a foundation so that you can build upwards on it. The concept of, of, uh, of Yesod, trait number six, is a little bit of a, of a synthesis of traits four and five because that's how all of these things work in these triangular triads, one, two, and the synthesized into three, four, five, and synthesized into number six. And the concept of Yesod is associated with, with righteousness, with Joseph, our, uh, you know, the, the eldest, if you will, of the, of the children of, of Rachel, the, the, the head of the tribes in his day, Joseph, and um, uh, the famous one who, uh, was the second in command of all Egypt, and he was sold. He was originally sold down to Egypt, but he ultimately was put in charge and and saved all the rest of the family through his uh, through his wisdom and his righteousness. So interestingly, Joseph is the uh, the only one in Tanakh who is given the uh, the complimentary moniker of Hatzadik. He's he's named Yosef Hatzadik, which means Joseph the righteous. A tzaddik is a righteous person. That's a pretty fine title to have, you know? A righteous person is a top drawer. He's the only one that got it. And the concept of righteousness like that, of, of, of tzedek or tzidkus, um, is associated with this track, this trait of yesod very closely in the verse uh, which, in which we say tzaddik yesod olam, which I believe is in Psalms. Tzadik Yesod Olam, it's either a verse or a, uh, a dictum of our sages, which is that the, the righteous are really the foundation of the world. The Yesod, the foundation of the world. Everything is built upon their shoulders. You may have heard this concept, very beautiful idea that, that in every generation, there are Lamed Vav, the number 36, there are 36 hidden tzaddikim, righteous people that are not necessarily well known, 
that that on their merit, the whole world continues to exist. They're like the foundation. They're like the bedrock upon which all of humanity lives. They're tzaddik yisod olam. The righteous are the are the foundation of life. You know, they are the you know that is in a sense that's the, the the purpose for which each of each of us was created was to try to be that uh, to emulate that 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 righteousness. Now. You know, for our for our purposes, if we think of it as again the synthesis of traits four or five into six, we we could think about it as as a as the 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 union, if you will, of heaven and earth. And when we speak of righteousness, we think of 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 like godliness in the here and now, where we think that that through my decisions and through my life and the you know the way that I go about my day and my week and the the way that I treat others and the things that I invest myself in in my time etc that if that 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 shows godliness right here meaning i i i model my life and i and i adopt values and i make decisions based on these principles and values of the torah i adopt a lifestyle of the torah and i strive by that to to reflect godliness in this world by my very by my very decisions okay and that's the concept of yesod it's as if there's a there's a union in, in in a righteous person there's a union of heaven and earth and that's and that's what we uh, we all strive for that integration of heaven and earth to try to make even the most basic things that we do our most our earthly lives if you will try to make those uh, worthy when you try to make those, um, uh, we try to make our lives lives in which the principles of heaven, the Torah's principles, are are lived and seen, and that's that's kind of what righteousness could be can be described. In many other ways, one could describe righteousness, but in in terms of the trait of yisod, that's how you would describe it. And uh, and and that's uh, like all these traits is something that each of us try to adopt. You know, the we shouldn't think that the righteous that's like a that's like somebody else. That's like the people who live on the other side of the street. Like I, that's not me. I live on that side of the street, and they live on that. No, you're supposed to think that that you are a righteous person. You know, uh, at least moderately so, and and hopefully gaining on in the process. You know, you're not. What, what would be the opposite? Think of yourself as a wicked person, as a rotten person? No, you're not a rotten, wicked person. You shouldn't think of yourself that way. You should think of yourself as a righteous person who has more to grow and more to gain to become as righteous as Joseph, as as Joseph at Sadik. And uh, and the more that we can try to um, try to. Um, uh, what would be the word? Manifest to show, to express with uh, with every uh, moment of our day in life, uh, godliness right down here in this world. That would be the trait of Yisod. Now, um, with I also want to move on one more thing for today. Um, the last few minutes of the show, we were um, we were really uh, talking yesterday about this incredible mitzvah. Of, uh, of agricultural Shabbos, you know, it's a Sabbath from planting every every seven years. The whole land of Israel, all the farmers and even non-farmers, we all stop mowing the lawn. You know, every, I think everybody needs a break from mowing the lawn, frankly. So, you know, every seven years we could take a break from that and uh, a mandatory break from mowing the lawn and all those kind of agricultural pursuits. Um, let's say that you uh, are a farmer that has a banana orchard. We were talking about bananas and banana trees, and you have a banana orchard. So interestingly, you know, without, even though you don't do much about it, you don't have to uh, necessarily plant new trees every year. Your trees make uh, bananas every year. Those bananas on a sabbatical year, however, the Torah says are hefker. Okay. Word of the day. Hebrew word of the day. Hefker. What does Hefker mean? It means ownerless. It means they're out of your possession. They're not your bananas. That for that year, the land of Israel is really not owned by you or anybody else for that matter. It is ownerless. And what that would mean would be is if someone would be uh, would like to, they want a banana, then you are prohibited from stopping them from walking up and taking a banana from your own field. It's, it's not your field that year. It's Hefker. It's ownerless. And that means that anybody is, uh, is invited to, to eat whatever volunteers, whatever produce or tree fruits emerge without farming. You're allowed to take it. And, and the, the explanation for such is very beautiful. Because the, the, the Torah says when describing the point of the sabbatical year, 
it says that, uh, you know why um, you're, you're obligated in this is, is because you should remember, says God, that the land of Israel is really mine. It's not yours. Don't think that the land is yours. It's my land. And your guests of my land and all, you know, for six out of seven years, I, uh, I give it to you to, uh, to farm, to enjoy, to do with what you like. There's some obligations. You have to tithe things and you have to give to the poor, etc. But the, the field is like yours. But one out of every seven, you're going you're gonna to be reminded that it's not really yours. The land of Israel is my land, says God. It's my land. It's a holy place. It's a holy land. And it's my land. And you're my guests. And therefore, I, uh, I'm in the position to say that it's, it's uh, now it's anyone's, the fruits of my land are for anyone to take. And that is uh, really an awesome perspective, not only uh, to, you know, for that one year, but for all times, you know, we're guests, you know, we're just guests here, you know, we're, we're passing through, you can't get too, uh, uh, you know, too stingy about anything if it's not really yours, you know, hey, that's my, uh, that's, you know, that's my car, those are, that's my wallet, and, the, and that's my, those are my shoes, stay out of them, you know, I mean, again, if they're not really yours, if I would go over to your house, and, uh, um, you know, and I would see a pair of your slippers, and I would start to get fussy, and say, hey, everybody stay out, you know, nobody touch those slippers. Well, they're not mine. I, I would never say that. I never think to be stingy about something that's not really mine. So if we can uh, hold on to that perspective uh, that the world, in fact, the whole world is ultimately Hashem's, it's God's. And uh, maybe we, we, we would be a little more um, ready and willing to share what he has otherwise given into our possession. I heard a beautiful, beautiful idea Imagine for a second that someone gave you a gift, an outright gift of $7 million. Can you imagine $7 million? You're about to get a gift of $7 million, direct deposit. And the only condition is you have to take one of those million dollars and you have to donate it to Sadaka. okay? So would you take the deal? Well, I would think so. I mean, look, you're giving me seven. You're asking me back for one. So it's a net of six. I mean, I, well, of course I would do that. So, you know, God gives us seven days of every week. He gives us life. And all he wants is one special day. You know, when he, when he, when he asks us to, you know, to give that, would we give that one day up? Would you say, no, I won't take a, a week. I won't take my life. I won't take the gift because you want, you want me to, you know, you want to run my Shabbos. If, uh, if we, we, could, we could farm and eat and enjoy for six years and then God says, don't forget, but the land is mine and I want you to remember, I want you to rest on that one sabbatical year. Could you do it? Yeah, you know, it might be tough taking a whole year off, but you could do it. All the other, uh, all the other years of produce, as hard as we work, we have to recognize it's still a gift. And the holy land is the holy land and it's God. So all of these things are part of what we remember when we read Parshish Bihar and we read about this 49 year cycle and then the Jubilee year is really, it's a, it's a, it's a festive way of recognizing that we are just guests here, that uh, we are visited with a lot of beautiful gifts. And, um, and when, we have they have, when we are asked to uh, utilize the gifts, the great gifts that we've been given in ways that the giver would like, we should be quick, quickly ready and willing to do so. Okay, we'll call it here for today, everybody. Have a healthy and a holy, and we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow again at Live at Five.